Thank you, John, and welcome everyone. Uh, it's really a privilege to be sitting beside Peter and Robin. Um, and, and really grateful to John for organising this. Um, I think John has posed a sort of question without realising it, for calling Peter and Robin Tories. I think Robin's reaction was like uh, quite a surprised face. Do you want to say anything about that before we start? <laughs> well, on these weekly walks that are mentioned here, I have spent an awful lot of time trying to persuade Robin to abandon the Conservative Party, uh, using very mild language. <laughs> yes. Um, so no, I think that's not really the truth. I haven't completely succeeded, I'm afraid. Um, yes. Am I switched on? Yes. Yes, I mean, um, that gives rather a misleading impression. We don't spend our entire time talking about transubstantiation, but we do. Um, we do from time to time. <laughs> we have touched on transubstantiation, but uh, no, actually, our uh, our our, um, our link goes back many years because we have daughters who have been good friends and were at the high school together, and then so there's a family connection. We've known each other for many years, and um, uh, but. Uh, I don't think anyone who wants to get on Peter's right side would call him a Tory. Um, that wouldn't go down well at all. I, I, on the other hand, have been a naive Tory for many years. Somebody who has been gulled <laughs> into believing. <laughs> someone who's been gulled into believing that actually the Conservative Party was in some sense conservative, but um, the scales have fallen from my eyes as they have from many other people's. We're here really to talk about, about uh, your faith, I suppose. Um, the poster says that you are both conservative Christians. This is not working very well. Is that how you would describe yourselves as conservative Christians? Um, no, but I think anybody else would. Uh, I think it's very difficult uh, to be a Christian without being a conservative myself. But on the other hand, I am... Um, when I confront my own church, the Church of England, I do often find that there are quite a lot of people in it who don't seem to be very conservative uh, compared with me. So that makes me conservative, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't regard anything that I believe as being especially conservative by the standards of the past 2,000 years. It may have become conservative in the past 60 years, in which almost everything worth having has become conservative, but that's not my fault. It was somebody else's idea. <laughs> Uh, Robin? Um, well, I think the, my own view is that if you're to be properly conservative um, in this country, you have to be a Christian, is my view. Because I think that the, as I understand conservatism, Peter actually put it rather well in, a, uh, in, in something he said the other day, when he said that to be a conservative means to believe in God, to love, your, to love God, to love your family, to love your country. And I think actually that is something I can wholly concur with. I mean, I believe that to be true. I believe that is the basis of what it is to be conservative. Um, so does that make me a conservative Christian? I suppose, well, I'm a Roman Catholic, and um, Catholics are, uh, that is, faithful Catholics who accept the um, teaching and uh, authority of the church um, are necessarily viewed as, as conservatives in this society because we sign up to beliefs which are certainly now countercultural in every sense of the word. It's just you keep getting these popes who are more or less trustless. <laughs> well, I was about to ask about, uh, um, about His Holiness. Uh, yes. Um, he recently said that uh, sometimes he would define conservative as one who clings to something and does not want to see beyond that. Uh, he was talking in an interview, uh, 60 Minutes it was called, uh, in America. Um, so how would you respond to that? Oh, it's just abuse. Um, I, don't, I don't regard uh, my liberal and left-wing friends as stupid. Uh, or blind. I think they just, particularly on matters of religion, I think they just have different opinions from mine, which I hope derive from different experiences and from different reading 
Uh, but there is a tendency, I'm afraid, among people on the liberal left, not just in church but everywhere else, to assume that conservatives are not just wrong but bad, uh, which I'd never reciprocate. Uh, it, it seems foolish uh, if you close your mind to what other people think. No one's, no one is right all the time. And it, it, you should always listen to your opposition. And to say that you're clinging to something and not, and not seeing beyond it, as I said, it, it does strike me as, as more or less abuse. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that Francis, um, from my point of view, is somebody who has sowed <coughs> he has sowed confusion both within the Catholic Church and in, 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 in to a wider audience because he speaks very often off the cuff, and um, I mean, there is a, a misunderstanding about the essentials of Catholicism, the way in which. Um, what the Pope says when he's chatting to journalists at the back of the aeroplane does not change t church teaching. And actually, Francis has, um, ha has adhered, in fact, to everything which I was brought up to believe as a Catholic, which is a long time ago. I mean, I'm somebody who was schooled in uh, old Catholicism back in the 1950s and 60s. And so, um, and the faith in its essence has not changed since then. But I also think that Francis was talking, of course, to American audience. And in that context, the word conservative has overtones which it probably doesn't carry here. Yeah. So, you know, conservatism, conservative Christians in America are a very particular subgroup of Christians worldwide. And, and I don't think you can read across from the American situation directly to the to the UK situation, for instance, or indeed European situation. That's an interesting analysis because I'm not a Roman Catholic, obviously, but um, I do have this theory that because the Pope is a Jesuit, he is himself not, as you said, changing any doctrine, but he is extremely good with the media and is uh, perhaps sometimes too off the cuff in what he says, and people will interpret what he says as a change in doctrine, but actually he's he's just trying to meet an audience. Would you say that's true? I think that's true, and I think he, you know, he, he came in after all, a lot of people saw Ratzinger, his, his predecessor, Joseph Ratzinger, as a rather austere figure, which indeed he was in some ways, but uh, someone who was probably the leading theologian of the Catholic Church in the second half of the 20th century, a very learned man and a brilliant writer. And Francis was, I think, as often happens with popes, the, um, the, the conclave, it seems to me anyway, that you, you get, um, there are politics at work. I mean, I, I know nothing about it, I mean, that's good. So I know nothing about the inner workings of the conclave, but I know that we have had um, a series of, of contrasting popes from conclave to conclave. So you had uh, John the Twenty Third, who was you know um, a very open and um, a man who who uh, displayed Christian love in a very uh, clear and very relatable way to people. He was followed by Paul the Sixth, who was quite a different character, a more austere character altogether. And I think that's often the way it goes. So. I wouldn't be surprised if she, when Francis actually moves on, um, uh, whether we'll get a, a contrasting pope again. Have you always been a Roman Catholic? Yeah. yeah. So I was, well, I, I, when my mother was uh, an Anglican, um, and I used to go along to, when I was very little, and then she converted along with my dad, and I was about five at that time, and then I was um, packed off to a very strict um, Catholic boarding school, which, um, and then, you know, as many of us do, I went through a period of, uh, in my late adolescence, where I um, turned away from, turned away from the church and, and away from Christianity, I suppose. But what I, it becomes a point, I think, in everybody's life, if they're a thinking person and if they put their mind to it, where you have to decide what rules am I going to live by? And, and there came a point where, when I considered the alternatives, I could not fault the Christian doctrine as I understood it about how one should live. So um, I could not fault 
the generosity of spirit, which lies, I think, at the core of Christianity. And that seems to me to be wholesome and good and uncontradictable. So I came back to it, and since then I've tried my best to, <laughs> as we all do, but um, you know, with, 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 with mixed results sometimes. But um, yes, since then I've been a Catholic. Peter, you haven't always been a man of faith, have you? No, no, no. Um, I went a, 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 a parallel of Rome, but slightly different. Really. I concluded around about the age of 12 that I very much disliked the idea that there was God. Uh, it was a nuisance to me and what I wanted to do and what I wanted to be. Uh, and it, it grew during my teens into a much more definite desire for this not to be the case. I personally believe completely that uh, all belief is based upon desire. You believe about the unknowable. You believe what you desire. And I, I desired a pointless universe in which none of my actions uh, had any effect beyond their own immediate detectable results, and in which I wasn't responsible for anything, and in which I was therefore free in a way as I imagined it in my adolescent way, uh, which was all that I desired. If there's a very good description of this feeling in Somerset Maugham's autobiographical novel of human bondage, in which Philip Carey, the hero at one point on a visit to Germany, stands looking over some vast forest, and this idea comes to him that he can, he can simply cast aside everything he's been taught to believe and everything he's been told restrains his actions. And that was how I felt. I think uh, it's very much what Maugham felt, and he didn't ever give that up. I later found out that it wasn't, uh, to me at least, satisfactory and that the, the freedom that he'd offered wasn't in fact freedom at all. It was the freedom of somebody trying to negotiate a forest without a map, uh, which isn't really freedom, it's just confusion. But there's a long period uh, during which I, I, I was very uh, determined to be atheist and uh, regarded religious belief with contempt. What was the shift? Oh, I, I grew up. I mean, it'd be, the, the, thing, the thing about it, I had a, a, a childhood that was blissful, idyllic responsibility where I could get away with doing practically anything. Uh, I went eventually, after a period of juvenile delinquency, to a new university in the 1970s where, again, I couldn't do anything in a kind of spacecraft lowered from above in which all the... In fact, if, when I go back there and visit it now, it makes me think that we were actually presented with the world of the 2020s in 1970. Uh, all, of the, all the irresponsibilities and, and lack of laws and restrictions were available to us then. And then I had to go and work for a living, and I had to balance my books and pay rent out of it. <coughs> and I also had to meet other people who weren't like me. And then I went through all the cliches of, uh, of, of marriage and parenthood, and these things very rapidly uh, wear away at the arrogant certainties of the atheist, in my view. Whenever I argue with it, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me. Only in, in one case, this is a personal one I've had, but only in the case of one intellectual atheist I've ever seen, the, the American philosopher Thomas Nagel, have I ever noticed one who sees this point. If you ask atheists why they don't believe, they say things like, oh, I lack belief, I never believed. I go, well, no sentience person has not at some point wondered how the universe came to be. Uh, it, it, it mollusks possibly lack belief, and, and cowpacks, I suppose, do, but no human lacks belief. They, the evasiveness the of atheists in this argument is, is huge, because I think, because I used to be one of them, that what they're avoiding is, is confessing what, what I here confess, which is that, in fact, atheism is about selfishness, and that is its main purpose, and that is why people embrace it. But the, the other thing about atheists is they want to be selfish themselves, but they're very happy if other people aren't selfish. So I, I, people who live in large North Oxford houses writing books about atheism are very glad when people who come in clean their, clean their house or the people who fix their cars are not atheists. They don't want them to be atheists. They don't want them not to care about morality or to have any fundamental view that there is right, there's no right and no wrong. It's for them, but it's not, it's, it's not for the, it's not for the plebeians. It's very much a, a, a religion uh, of, the, of the rich. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 um, I overheard a conversation between a, um, a churchman and an atheist, and um, the, 
the conversation got to the point where he said, where the, the churchman said, so what are the values of atheism? And his, uh, her response, and she said to me, she said, well, there are no values in atheism. Which actually, when you think about it, makes perfect sense, because um, that's not to say, of course, that individual atheists do not have values, but there is no, there is no coherent um, corpus of belief which amounts to a set of values which atheists can, um, can buy into. It is um, wholly self-centered. It is um, entirely individualistic. You become your own god, I suppose. And, um, so, which is why I think we're in the mess we are in, actually, um, because society has unfortunately embraced many of these ideas. Um, and in doing so, we've jettisoned many of the civilizing values which um, benefit us so greatly as a nation. I mean, that is how I see it. How would you say that it, faith changes society? How would you wish to see that Christian faith is transformative? Well, um, you know, I've been trying to avoid <laughs> as much of the election campaign as I, as, I, as I can because it's been so dreary, but I was listening to a debate the other day on um, the radio and it was about shoplifting. And um, the, the idea, or it seems to be the case now, that, that shopkeepers, big shopkeepers and little shopkeepers, had to contend with a constant stream of theft, which goes unpunished. And this is at epidemic levels, it's hitting their profit margins and making it very difficult for some shops to continue. Now, um, typically, the Today program never got round to talking about what seems to me to be the obvious answer uh, or the obvious question to ask, which is why have we gone from being a country which in the 1950s um, was uh, very law-abiding by and large with a low, cry, a low level, of, a low rate of crime of all sorts, I mean both uh, dishonesty and crimes of violence were at a very low level, to, to a, a society where there is now very little break on something as fundamental as honesty and shoplifting. And of course the, the question that the day program wanted to pursue was, well, then we need more policemen on the beat. Well, certainly, more policemen on the beat wouldn't go amiss, but that is not, is it? That is not the reason why we have a shopping epidemic. It's because um, people do not adhere to um, those old rules of right and wrong, which I was brought up with, and I suspect most in this audience were brought up with. We have rejected those ideas, and we make excuses now for things which should not be excused. Um, and, you know, that's a, that would be an, I, I think that, that, that once upon a time, most children in this country were brought up on an understanding of what was right and wrong, which we would recognize as being the lineaments of Christian belief in, in that respect. And people no longer have that. And so consequently, what you have is a moral chaos and uh, a rise in, in that sort of petty crime in that respect, but other more serious crime. Would you concur with that, Peter? Yes, I'd go slightly deeper. Um, the, one of the fascinating things about modern Britain is that almost everything you do is now watched by closed circuit television cameras. Uh, it's everywhere, on, in, in the street, on, on trains, in shops, in, 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 in schools, in, in some homes, people install them secretly. And this seems to me to symbolize the collapse of conscience, uh, and indeed to, 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 to state it that we have given up conscience and replaced it with surveillance. I think it's an enormous and serious loss. Uh, now, the other thing is that uh, my 
the last generation who I think were brought up seriously uh, with Christianity. I, I remember my, particularly my aunt and uncle who lived on the Portsmouth into the 1980s. These were Ed Williams. They knew uh, both the King James Bible and the Book of Common Prayer pretty much by heart, all of it. It was right in everything, everything they did. They'd been brought up uh, with the details and the poetry and the literature of belief, of conscience, of the, of, of the danger of sin from the very start. It's something that they just knew instinctively. When they departed from us, I don't think subsequent generations had anything like that intensity of feeling. We were a, a very much more peaceful society when that was so. I think the Victorians, the people, the, 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 the Robert Peel's police and an awful lot of other things went into the creation of Victorian social peace. Uh, but I think um, Gertrude Himmelfarb always said that it was not those things, but the Sunday schools which actually achieved it. And before that, I think almost certainly the preaching of John Wesley in, in, the, in the 18th century laid a foundation of understood and absorbed and internalized morality, which was completely lost and very, very difficult to reconstruct. There's one other thing I'll just bore on about, one, which is the, is the authority of the state and the willingness of people to use it. There's a very significant omission from the coronation service uh, a couple of years ago. Every single coronation service, I went and looked back as far as I could go, and certainly every single coronation service since William and Mary had contained a pledge which the king must make when he's presented with the sword of state, that he will use it for the terror and punishment of wrongdoers. And this phrase, the terror and punishment of wrongdoers, was excised, and it had, to, it had to be excised because it was in the service before and had been in for, for 400 years at least, probably before. It was deliberately excised, I would almost certainly assume by Justin Welby uh, with the agreement of the king. People aren't prepared, people who take offices of state are no longer prepared to exercise the authority which they've been given. They won't do it, and their weakness is apparent to everybody who wants to be wrong. Our prisons aren't full uh, because, of some, uh, because they're, they're a tremendously impressive society. <coughs> Our prisons are full because you have to try so hard to get into them. It's much harder in this country. <coughs> it's much harder in this country to get into prison than just to get into university. <laughs> there's, a, there's one thing I, I, I was talking to someone recently. Um, someone who goes to the church I go to, which is uh, <coughs> St. Aloysius. The oratory. This man, um, long-term resident of Oxford, a senior businessman who has been in, uh, his life has been spent in, he's had fingers in many pies, but he's been a developer and in property. And um, he said something which I thought uh, was quite alarming, but also uh, confirmed something which I suspected to be the case, which is that, so he said he was dealing with developers and planners throughout his, his professional life. And he said for 40 years, uh, first 40 years of his career, he never had any suspicion at any time that there was anything untoward. He never had a sniff, a whiff of corruption. He said in the last 15 years, he had been involved in deals which were inexplicable without the explanation of some corruption. And his suspicion is that, that within local government now and within business circles, um, corruption is far more prevalent than most of us think it is because we've been, I think I was brought up in this. I, I've always believed really in the incorruptibility of British society because I've never come across it, I've never come across direct corruption in the sense of being asked, you know, for, for a bribe or anything like that. But I thought it was interesting that this was a man who, you know, nearly 80 now, and that was his reflection in his career, just the sense that in some way something was gone and that now corruption is abroad in the country in a way that it wasn't when he was a young man practicing his business. And I think that's something, you know, I also noted actually that there's this organization called Transparency International, which is an organization which measures the corruption. 
I'm not sure how they do it, don't ask me about the methodology, but they rank countries in order of incorruptibility. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the Scandi countries are all at the top. We've fallen down the ratings in recent years, so we're slipping down the ratings um, quite significantly. And I think that's something we should all be worried about, and I think it's something we should ask the question, why is this happening? I think, I think that, you know, I think PJ and I, and you, Father Michael, I'm sure would agree that actually, you know, what we've lost is a, a moral fiber in the country, which has led to actually a, um, a diminishing of, of, of personal morality. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the coronation earlier. Um, as you know, the Church of England is established, um, the established Church of England. Do you feel that it works? That's a good word. The most impressive part is the, is the four parish priests and vicars uh, in uh, parts of the country where President Norris visits. They're probably the only sort of sign of, uh, of authority and goodness in those areas, which the Church of England maintains in its parishes all over the country. The least impressive part of it is the hierarchy, uh, which is almost entirely gobbled up by politics um, uh, and ambition, and, of which I pay as little attention to as I possibly can. And the one thing that makes me laugh, though, is when uh, revolutionary radicals say, this is a theocracy. We have bishops in Parliament in the House of Lords. Do you ever look and see how those bishops actually speak and vote? I mean, they, they make Trotsky look um, moderate. This is not a theocracy. And the establishment of the Church has not created a theocracy. Whatever its failings are, that's not one of them. As a Roman Catholic, how do you relate to the establishment, as in the Church of England being established? Well, um, I'm glad that we have an established church. And um, someone once said to me, it's a phrase which stuck in my mind. <coughs> uh, so, in the debate about disestablishing the church, so, uh, so this person said, well, if you go up into your attic, and you see there's this massive great wooden beam, and you think, that's not really doing anything, I'll <coughs> cut it down. Don't be surprised if the roof falls in. So what I mean is that the idea that we should have the church in some sense at the center of, of, of national life, although it's not my church, it is a Christian church. And as Peter and I, I think, would, I hope Peter would agree, that over the years of our many talks about things, we, although we have our differences, certainly, in religious matters, the thing is that far more unites us in what we believe than in what, what divides us. And I think that, that although ecumenism has the, the sort of formal ecumenical movement has dwindled in recent decades. In fact, Catholics um, and other Christians of all denominations have far more in common um, than divides us. And, and, you know, this in the Catholic Church, we, we always pray. We, there's a, a prayer we say at every Mass, which is for, for the unity of the Church. And, um, you know, in, in, in God's time, um, that may well happen. After all, the, the Reformation, it may seem distant to us, but in the life of the Church, it is, it is, it is, is a relatively short period of time. And there's no reason why in time there shouldn't be a reconciliation, would be my view. Do you agree with that, Peter? Oh, more or less. Um, I think I think the old drive for Christian unity, which didn't go anywhere much, uh, has really been replaced by general huddling together for warmth, mm -hmm. as we all recognise that we're uh, we're dwindling away very rapidly, and there isn't much point fighting each other. Not that there aren't some people who always want to have a fight with me, say about um, Queen Elizabeth uh, the first. Yeah. Can I say anything about Queen Elizabeth the first? on antisocial media, 
I am surrounded by swarms of Muslim people, usually from the north of England, uh, shouting at me about how I believe in the uh, persecution of the Roman Catholic. <laughs> so there's, it's still there if you want it, if you want to go out and have a sort of selfie, because that's just yeah. Rangers punch up. Uh, the, the, the elements are still there if anybody wants it, but it's really only a few, a few enthusiasts to keep it going. Well, the crimes of Elizabeth were as nothing compared with the crimes of the Oliver Cromwell. Oh, well. Um, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm just reading a book at the moment which is uh, a fascinating history of the interregnum. What is shocking is to realize the mercilessness of the new model army in Ireland. And the, it is reckoned, I mean, it, 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 this, it, this is an extraordinary statistic, but it is reckoned that in the period from 1642 to the end of the 1650s, a quarter of the Irish Catholic population perished. That was about half a million out of, out of two million. I mean, that's a, that's a lot of people. And um, I think, I've always been a, a unionist and an Englishman. I, I, I am an Englishman. And um, I have always, you know, I, I have been rather um, dismissive of the Irish. You know, this, you know the old thing about a uh, moat. Cancel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the Irish are moat, the, the most oppressed people ever. And you think, well, actually, they're just whinging on about something which happened a long time ago. When you look at actually the record, it's not pretty. And um, we, uh, you know, the sins of English colonialism, British colonialism, if you like, uh, are nowhere better demonstrated, perhaps, than in our nearest neighbour. So that's something which um, I've been just suddenly become reacquainted with that idea. And it's quite a sobering one, too. Um, you, you said about huddling together, Peter, um, presumably dwindling numbers you were referring to, of adherence to the churches, yeah. yes. So, institutional religion is declining, people aren't coming to church in the way they were, the statistics are clear. Um, but yet people are still longing for some kind of spiritual connection. Um, can we do anything to turn the tide? Uh, uh, yeah, I wouldn't come to me and ask me questions like that. I am by profession a pessimist. And I would say no. But I might be wrong, you see, in which case I would give me bad advice. But ask somebody else that. They might be helpful. <laughs> well, I, 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 I think that as Christians we have to be optimistic. I think that, um, I think that uh, if, if we are right, if we can take God's word for it. Um, I think that, uh, that the promise of Christianity, the truth of Christianity, is something which in the long run wins out. But if you're asking me, can we, could we expect some, I tell you something though, I tell you, this, this is, I, I have been struck in recent years, um, the number of young, energetic Christians I've met, actually. And I don't know, I mean, I, you know, having, having been a journalist all my life, uh, but, but in a different sort of milieu now, I, I've been struck by the number of young people who take uh, religion seriously, and I think that is from a Christian point of view, very optimistic. But I do think that, you know, that, that the, the promise of Christianity is, yes, is something that we have to have belief and faith in. And so, um, unlike Peter, I mean, Peter is a pessimist. <laughs> Peter is, he is a pessimist. Um, but, uh, and, and, um, and I'm not. No, I've tried to set the right on this many times <laughs> as we stride along various riverbanks towards <laughs> various pubs without nasal hair streaming in the wind and our joints creaking. I have tried to persuade Robin of the virtues of pessimism. It's being pessimistic that keeps me so cheerful, <laughs> explained to him. But he won't listen. No. no I won't. <laughs>
yeah, you're right. You mentioned the younger people that you've that you've met that are very um, enthusiastic about their faith. And I mean, one of the things that struck me as quite interesting um, is that the public figures that have turned to faith. I'm thinking of two in particular. One, Russell Brand, who's just been baptised in the <laughs> River Thames. Um, interestingly, I know Russell a bit because he used to come to my church in East London. He, so do I. Um, and then there was another uh, recent <coughs> Candace Owens. Candace Owens, yeah. She has. Um, yeah. why, why do you think that's, that's happened? Obviously, you know, in some senses, People become Christian because, for whatever really personal reasons, but okay. why is it? Why is the media focused on them so much? Is the, really the question I'm asking, not not their personal journey, but why well, my, do you think the media is focusing on them? Well, my answer would be that um, that life is, in the most general terms, a search for meaning. Is it not? And you know, I think uh, that anyone who who thinks about life has to search for meaning. And, uh, and that is why a certain number of people will always be drawn ineluctably to Christian faith, because it is um, coherent, convincing, and it, it leads to um, a, it, I think it makes people happy. Action. I think faith makes people happy, and I, I I know that you know there's been quite a lot of research recently, which has been you know reported in recent years about how people who do have faith seem to live happier, longer lives. That's not <laughs> maybe that's something we should advertise more, you know. But it's but actually. It's not a surprise, is it? It is not a surprise. In fact, it's blindingly obvious that if you believe in something, especially something as which encourages the individual to be selfless and to work for the community, anyone who does that finds that the rewards that come back to you from that effort you make are tenfold to what you put in. So, you know, the, the, so, and Christianity, because it encourages that sort of engagement with your fellow men, is bound, I think, to make you happier. So that's why I think that, that people will, you know, like Candace Owens, um, I, don't, I know nothing about her really, but I know she's, um, you know, she, she has, yeah. <clears throat> Do the same thing, did you? Um, probably best not. Uh, particularly about Russell Brown. Okay. I've met him. So I think, I, I, you know, who knows? Perhaps this is one of the great moments of the Christian church. <laughs> hold our breath and, and, uh, and pray for his salvation, but on the other hand, perhaps it isn't. Okay. Um, you mentioned, uh, you sort of edged towards talking about. Um, <coughs> The, the reaching out aspect of, of faith and, and the responsibility to um, help our fellow human. Yes. Um, and I know you've been sort of very seminally involved in the Oxford Food Bank's creation. And yes. Now the Oxford Hub. Um, well, do you think that, that the Christians of whatever hue, whether conservative, liberal, or whatever, have a responsibility to uh, engage in, for want of a better term, social justice? Of course. The Catholic social teaching is quite clear about that. There's no doubt about it. So, um, but my own involvement, I mean, you know, just a potted history of my own involvement with the Food Bank was that I was uh, at a loose end. I'd written a book about the BBC, which I expected to change the world, which it didn't. And uh, <laughs> I found myself at a bit of a loose end, and I fell into this thing uh, and started it up with, with another chap, just the two of us, and in a very small way. And what was so uh, life-affirming about that was that uh, the people of Oxford, both in terms of volunteering and in terms of supporting the thing with money, 
and the supermarkets which gave us food and the wholesalers who joined in, it was a remarkable demonstration of the way in which um, the springs of charity are, once you tap them, you know, the, there are so many people of goodwill around, and certainly not all our volunteers by any means were, were, were Christian. Uh, some of them were, but a lot of them were, more of them, I suppose, were sort of eco-types or, um, you know, green, green types or not a retired people. But, you know, that was, uh, it was really a lesson for me that um, it just, just to the enthusiasm of people and, the, and so, the way people gave so much of themselves to it. Um, endless time and effort went into it. It was all entirely voluntary at first, anyway. I mean, they had paid staff now, but, but, um, but it was, uh, it was, I don't know if there's something in the air in Oxford, you know, I, I would say, well, it's not a coincidence that Oxfam started in Oxford. I think there are, I think this is a town, this is a thinking town where people are aware of things in a way that you wouldn't necessarily find in every town of the same size in England. I think it's a, a special town in that sense. So I think you know, that's perhaps one of the reasons why it, um, it works so well. But I, I do think that you know, if you don't walk the walk in that sense, if you're just, you know, Christianity, quietism, disengagement from the world is not what we, not what most Christians are called to do. I mean, the eremitical life is, of course, a tradition in, in Christianity, and that is something different and special and completely out of my experience. But the, the ordinary Christian life has to be about engagement, otherwise it means nothing. Would you concur with that, Dietrich? Not completely. Um, I'm slightly <coughs> suspicious of the expression social justice. Uh, I'm, and especially in the, in the mouths of Christians. Uh, the, the doing of good, the doing justly and loving mercy and walking humbly by God, which we're supposed to do, is, as far as I'm concerned, and uh, William Blake put this extremely well made up in minute particulars in daily life of everything we do or indeed fail to do. And when we judge ourselves as we frequently do, I, I think, uh, as to how much we fail in that, when it is in those minute particulars that we mostly fail. Uh, I'm not sure there is such a thing as social justice. I think there are acts of kindness and generosity and mercy which, uh, which it calls us to do. But the idea that there is some sort of ideal uh, earthly society in which we can obtain a state of justice is probably a false belief and one which tends people towards utopianism, which I think is a disaster. Uh, so no, I don't, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not wholly sure, sure about social justice. Can I just say, yes. I, I, I certainly didn't get involved with the food bank with any idea of social justice. No, I wasn't accusing you of that. <laughs> I mean, I... I <laughs> so it wasn't I, driven by faith, was it? Or was it driven by care for humanity? Well, the thing or? is, how, how many times in your life do you get the opportunity to do something which which seems to be wholly good. <laughs> you know, I could never find a, I could never find a fault in it because I was talking to the current batch of food bank volunteers a couple of weeks ago, and um, so I, t I said, I, I, I told them this. I said, in the feeding of the five thousand, there's a there's a detail in Luke's Gospel, which is that when the 5,000 had been fed, the disciples were sent out to pick up what remained, and 12 baskets were filled with food left over from the feast of the 5,000. And I said, well, what that tells you is that Christ himself and the early Christians were against wasting food. Wasting food goes against one of the deepest, most basic human instincts, and giving food to other people who are hungry is one of the most basic forms of charity. It's not to do with social justice. And I certainly, it's just that 
you don't often get the opportunity. I, I feel myself, I've felt blessed, blessed to be able to be involved in that, which happened completely serendipitously. It wasn't, you know, it was nothing that you could plan, but it just happened, and I got involved in it. And, and that is, you know, it's, I'm lucky, very lucky to be able to do that. And I think that what actually my involvement with that charity taught me, one thing, was that people want, actually, a lot of people want a, a, an outlet for their generosity and charitable instinct, and it's difficult to find something which is pure, actually. Would you um, say that Jesus was political? Who you are. Uh, both <laughs> You get both. And no, and my kingdom is not of this world. Explicitly unpolitical, explicitly turning uh, his face away from politics, from the raising of the sword, uh, from the raising of rebellion, from the defiance of authority, uh, and telling Pilate that if, 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 if he had not been given power over him, then he would have none. It's, it, 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 as far as I'm concerned, politics is and has very much become in this country in the past 50 years a, a, a false religion, almost a form of blasphemy, a mistaken idea of how we should be setting out to um, to follow our consciences. So no, I, 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 the idea of, of, of Jesus being some sort of, some sort of uh, Judean Che Guevara does not appeal to me, nor do I think is it, is it supported by scripture. Um. Well, some of the things he said certainly you know, plucked out from the, the texts are, you know, they are political in, 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 or, or are construed in a political sense in our own modern day context, aren't they? You know, the idea of render to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's, that is actually a, in a way, a profoundly political statement. Surely it's a sidestepping. Deliberate, conscious sidestepping of political involvement. Yes, but he is saying that he is saying, isn't he, that that lawful authority should be respected and obeyed. So, I mean, is that not? I mean, that 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 that, that and that would be that is a very conservative viewpoint. I mean, you know the. We'll, we'll have a change of government in a few weeks' time. Oh, and, well, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we will, uh, or I certainly will obey its um, injunctions. Um, perhaps a little reluctantly, but, um, you know, you do, because that's, uh, that's what you do. And, I mean, that's, isn't that, I mean, to, to be in rebellion against a legitimate authority yeah. is, uh, is... Well, then the arguments arise naturally about whether authority is legitimate or not. Uh, well... I was going to say on the issue of establishment, I was well back very quickly from that. An establishment isn't really a, a, a true thing anymore in our society. Since the Equality Act of, of 2010, the Christian religion has not been the accepted national religion of this country. It has been one of many religions competing on an equal basis with any other religion. And it was robbed of its, of its position as a national religion by that extraordinary, enormous, devastating act of parliament, which many people are still only just beginning to cope with. But that was one of its most profound effects. And you'll find increasingly, it was already happening before the act was passed, but the decisions given by judges will actually say explicitly that if anyone tries to plead, that English law is based on, <coughs> on Christian religion and on, uh, on, on, on biblical law, as it used to be. They will specifically say that that is no longer the case. And how long in a society where the law is increasingly aggressive and secular, uh, the, you know, the obedience to authority uh, is possible for a believing Christian, I'm not entirely sure. But I think I can easily envisage sometime in the next 30 years, should I live so long, uh, there might be conflict of conscience on that for many, many people. No, I, I agree with that, actually. I agree with what you say. And um, I, I also think it's interesting that the Equality Act, it's interesting to me that in some commentaries 
amongst right-wing writers. The, uh, the Equality Act is now actually being seen as something which um, conservatives, I, I, with a small c, I mean, should work towards the repeal of. Yes, well, they don't foresee how to do that. <laughs> well, yes, because we haven't had it. So, I mean, no, as you we, say. But you, well, were one, you were the one who said it was the conservative government. Well, you, yes. I mean, so you were Jesus way, wasn't for the people, but we are. <laughs> I say, Peter was, was way ahead of the game in his um, clarity of vision that the Tory party is in and has not been a conservative party <coughs> for many decades. And um, in my naivety, I was, uh, as I say, I was gulled into the belief that it was. And uh, I now see the error of my ways. John has his hand up. Are we opening up to the floor, John? Thank you very much. I'm going to ask a particularly feature question. Okay. It's not what I'm telling you in the belief system. Trust you, but not to. Nothing at all. Anybody who doesn't change his mind in life has missed one of the great experiences uh, of, 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 of human existence. If you haven't changed your mind, then you, it's as if you've never seen the, the Grand Canyon or, 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 or Lincoln Cathedral or the Atlantic Ocean. It is a huge thing to do and very beneficial. I recommend it to all of you. You will lose some friends, but you'll probably in the end come around to feeling that you can manage without them. Uh, the, 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 the great point that I make is I did not leap direct from being a disciple of Leon Trotsky to being a, a communicant member of the Church of England. There was a long gap between, uh, during which I, I, I rode in many small boats and swam some stretches entirely on my own. And also, and there, there used to be, in fact, I think it probably still is, a sort of traffic between the Roman Catholic Church and the Communist Party. Uh, it, or rather, between the Communist Party and the Roman Catholic Church, the, the great instance of the of Douglas Hyde, the great 1940s defector from the Communist Party of Great Britain, um, who wrote a book called I Believe, which is still worth reading because of his, his uh, almost complete uh, leap in one process uh, from, from being an actor <coughs> and very committed member of the Communist Party to being an active with Catholic. I could not think. I, I needed a worldview uh, when I had, had lost my old one, but I could not think of anything less like Trotskyism than broad church Anglicanism. And I defy you to come with anything less like it. It's not a switch of, from one similar thing to another similar thing. It's totally different. Other questions from the floor? There's one at the back? Yeah. Can you stand up and talk loudly? Well, uh, I think that there are quite a lot of free riders in, in society who... So I was very fascinated by Richard Dawkins' comment recently that he was a cultural Christian. Uh, so he's clearly a professed atheist. Um, but he likes the fact that this is a society which has been moulded by a Christian morality. So he, but he, of course, will do nothing to, to bolster that belief system. And the real question is, how long, as the, as the core of Christian believers, the core, the understanding of Christian uh, belief attenuates going through society and in, in the future, how long will we actually retain these these um, remnants, these legacies from what we once were as a Christian society. So I think that, of course, you know, Christians are, are sometimes asked, 
I have been, I know, you know, okay, well, you know, atheists can be good people too, and I agree they can. You know, I'm not saying that, I think that, that there, are, there are people who, um, who are decent, good people, uh, but I think, myself, I believe that there aren't, that coming to your own uh, belief system and being good, uh, if there are such people, the effort to be, to be good is to be selfless. And, and that, is not, that is not what is the core of our current cultural understanding. It's all about the self and it's all about self-realization. That is the opposite of what Christianity teaches. And the, the more people who desert traditional Christian morality and go over to their own morality, their own, their own morality, then the weaker this these, this legacy becomes. That, that would be my fear. So, I don't know if that answers my question. But I would go further if I'm right. Uh, I'm a great believer in the power of fear uh, in getting people to behave. <coughs> there is a passage in Scripture which runs the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, and I think it's true. Uh, I've, in, on several occasions in my life, experienced fear as a real thing. It has a smell. Uh, it is not pleasant, uh, and its promptings have been extremely useful to me and have probably saved my life. Uh, and I would recommend it to people, understanding that there is... Christianity has a, a very soppy public relations man at the moment, <laughs> who presents it very much, and I think this is one of the reasons why it fails and why so many churches are empty, because it doesn't offer uh, anything solid at the bottom. It doesn't say, actually, ultimately, if you do not uh, follow uh, the commandments that you've been clearly instructed to follow, uh, then the consequences for you may be bad, because I think people actually appreciate knowing that, just as, as many people appreciate the existence of authority, uh, whether at work or in life or anywhere they are, and I think that the, the absence of it has been a great blow to many people. So I'm not, I'm not embarrassed about that, I'm not embarrassed to confess that I have myself felt fear and do feel fear. There are passages of Scripture uh, when it seems to me to be quite plain uh, that uh, we can't sit here and necessarily count upon uh, the modern version of hell being a sort of vague, cloudy separation from God. I think there might be a hell. Uh, I'm not sure it's the one that's portrayed in the great paintings, but I think there might be something you really don't want to go. And if you read some passages, for instance, the one of the most potent and concentrated pieces of Scripture in the Bible is the Epistle of James. And if, like me, your trade is in speaking and writing, there is a particular passage beginning with the words, the tongue is a fire, uh, which makes me tremble when I read it. Uh, not just for what I might do, but for what I have done. I, I have to say all these things are, are not in the, 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 the um, Rocky Horror versions, which again the church has now adopted. But in the King James version of Scripture, in which the, the, the full power of it is available, uh, I think people should. The idea that you could have a, a Christianity without God is an absurdity, and also the, the the idea that there is any right or wrong without God. And what is there is no uh, if, if there is no God, then what is your compass? How do you decide? Or what is right and what is wrong. And people are so totally unaware of what pre-Christian societies were like with their human sacrifices and their mass killings of prisoners and their exposure of, of newly born babies, babies on hillsides and their intense, callous cruelty in all manners which has been slowly but, but definitely driven out of society by specifically Christian belief and which as Christian belief fades into an afterglow will return. It does really in, in disguised forms, and those of us who were appalled by the, the killing of unborn babies uh, are, are more appalled than anything else by the indifference of everybody else. So it's astonishing, um, with, as, as we believe, extremely grave error and lack of civilization. But without, without God, without the scriptures, and without some idea of what right and wrong are, you're like the person in the avalanche who's been tumbled over and over and over and doesn't even know which way up he is. 
you don't know what's right and wrong. Why, why in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an accidental world, a cosmic car crash uh, with no creator, uh, why is it wrong for, 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 for me to reach out and smite Robin across the chops? <laughs> well, I mean, if I mean, Peter's exactly right on that. Exactly right. And I, 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 here we are as one. Because the, the, the point about accepting the word of God as revealed truth is what, uh, is what we understand to have happened in human history. That is why we obey the rules as best we can, as we understand them. Without that revelation, um, we are pitched back in, as Peter says, into a, a pre-Christian world um, where all sorts of unspeakable horrors will re-emerge. Well, they already have emerged. Yeah. One more question from this side. Yes. Me? Yes. I'm very, I'm very happy, but I, I have no plans for this. Some people couldn't hear the question. The oh. question was, uh, w what way would uh, Robin and, and Peter be voting in the general election? Because they, they talked about conservatism earlier. Oh, I, no, again, uh, I, I live on the wrong side of the channel. And um, as a result, I'm an Aussie. Uh, and as a result, I live um, under the tyranny of, um, of the Labour Party and have done for many years. There's no point in my voting, so I, I don't. If I lived in a constituency where my vote could make a difference, I would vote for whoever would defeat the Labour Party. Because I, re I regard this, and since we're having a bit of politics here, uh, I regard this election as one of the most significant elections in my lifetime or indeed in this country's history. It's uh, the, the, the contrast between the scale of the decision before the people and the triviality of the campaign, it's quite astonishing to me. Uh, that we, Keir Starmer is, is the most dogmatic and ideological uh, person to approach Downing Street uh, in, 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 in history. He's at, at least as radical as, as um, Alistair Campbell uh, when he was Prime Minister. Uh, <laughs> and probably more so. You don't have to answer the question. No, I, I, mean, I, I, um, I mean, I, if there was any hope of, um, I have not decided, actually. I mean, I, I voted Conservative throughout my life, except on one occasion. Um, and um, I, I feel that, uh, like Peter, I, I, I have, I feel great misgivings about what we're about to, what is likely to happen. Um, Leila Moran is, has an unassailable majority in this constituency, and so uh, I certainly wouldn't be voting for her anyway. Um, so I don't know. I mean, being a creature, you know, I'm a conventional creature of habit. So I may end up actually, God help me, uh, voting Tory. In fact, I spoke to the young um, Tory candidate who's run a couple of times. And uh, he's a young dentist, I think from, um, he's, he's of Indian extraction. I think. Sugary vinegar. Uh, yes, that's the one. And he seems, you know, he, 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 seems, he, he at least is very sound on the family. I might vote for him. What, what I find puzzled by is how so many people seem to regard the vote either as some sort of sacrament or a tremendous duty, as if people fought violently for it, which they didn't, in fact. And they were handed out like sweeties by politicians when they realized they could get us to bribe ourselves with our own money. Uh, and it, it isn't that. A, a vote is a practical action with a measurable result. It's neither a sacrament nor an emotional spouse. But if I suggest that you should just practice, well, there's no point in my, in, in my voting against uh, Annalisa Dodds. Uh, I, I quite like her, but there's no point in my voting against her. 
because my vote will make no difference. And people say, what? You're not voting? As if I was some kind of terrible sinner who went around letting down the tires of Robin's food bank van. <laughs> Which, of course, I've never done. Uh, and, and it's not like that. It's just a vote. And you can use it for practical effect often, but sometimes you just can't. And I, I really don't see why people should be put under pressure to use it when they have no use for it. Uh, stay home if you don't want to, or just go out for lunch, or go to France for the day. It is a good thing to do during a general election when you don't really have much to do with it. To Marie Le Pen. On, on that note, can we uh, thank yeah. Robin and Peter very much indeed.